Let's start with some amazing facts about the human brain. Did you know that the brain weighs only 2% of the body, yet consumes 20% of its energy? Did you know the brain operates with only 20 watts of power, which is what a small light bulb would need? With around 86 billion neurons and up to 1 quadrillion connections, which is a 1 with 15 zeros, the human brain contains over 500,000 kilometers of nerve fiber, more than enough to reach the moon from the Earth. All of these connections allow the brain to fire a quintillion calculations per second, which is a one with 18 zeros, or one exaflop in computing terms. Now, an exaflop is in the same ballpark as Frontier, the world's most powerful supercomputer, built by HPE and hosted in Knoxville, Tennessee. This monster consumes up to 21 megawatts of energy, which is enough to power a small city. More tellingly, that's enough power to run 21,000 microwaves. Do you remember how much power the brain needs? 20 watts of power. We know that the brain can learn from various types of data, such as our senses, language, emotions, and logic. The brain can also generate novel and creative ideas, as well as store and retrieve memories. Yet, the brain is still not fully understood by neuroscientists. One of them was giving a lecture to a group of students. He explained how the brain was divided into two hemispheres, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. He said that the left hemisphere was responsible for logical thinking, language, and analysis, while the right hemisphere was responsible for creativity, intuition, and emotion. He also said that each hemisphere had some personality and preferences, and that sometimes they could conflict with one another. He then asked the students if they had any questions. One student raised his hand and said, yes, professor, I have a question. How do you know which hemisphere is in charge? The neuroscientist smiled and said, that's easy. You just have to ask yourself, who's the boss? If you hear a voice in your head saying, I am, then it's your left hemisphere. If you hear a voice in your head saying, you are, then it's your right hemisphere. The student nodded and said, I see. Thank you, professor. He then asked himself, who's the boss? He heard a voice in his head saying, we are. He freaked out and said, oh no, I have three hemispheres. <laughs> now, the fact that we can fully understand the brain's inner mechanics hasn't stopped us from considering a source of inspiration and innovation for computing. In fact, mathematician and physicist John Boy Neumann's only book published during his lifetime was The Computer and the Brain, back in 1958. It was a collection of essays on topics such as the nature of intelligence, the architecture of computers, and the relationship between the two. All of us carry smartphones, tablets, and laptops today. All these devices exhibit a computing architecture devised by no other than von Neumann. This architecture has four components. First, a control unit that decodes instructions and controls how data flows through the computer. Second, the arithmetic logic unit, or LAU, which processes all the mathematical operations. The LAU and the control unit together make up the central processing unit, or CPU. The third component is the main memory unit, which holds the data and instructions. Finally, the input-output unit, where the computer communicates with external devices, such as keyboards, mice, monitors, printers, and so on. One of the issues of this architecture is the von Neumann's bottleneck, caused by the separation of memory and processing components. When a computer is performing a function, instructions are sequentially sent from the memory into the CPU. For processing, this is typically the part of the process that slows down a computer's throughput. In addition to the bottleneck, each of the billion transistors in today's chips only has three connections. Compare this with a neuron. You have the cell body or soma surrounded by dendrites that receive input signals. 
Branching out from the soma is the axon to transfer the signals to the dendrites of other neurons in the brain to the axon terminals. Through the dendrites and the terminals, each neuron is connected to up to 10,000 other neurons. And the most beautiful thing is that the connections themselves are the memory. Neurons communicate by generating voltage pulses or spikes at critical times. At each synapse, a spike from one neuron causes a brief flow of ions from the axon terminal into the dendrite of another neuron. This can be seen as charging or discharging energy. All of the neurons' voltage changes aggregate at the soma. If the excitation becomes strong enough for the receiving neuron, it somehow fires and generates an output spike. These spikes have no magnitude. They are binary events whose information is encoded by the specific times that they fire. The network of neurons functions then as a vast array of processors, which accounts for the brain's incredible energy efficiency. Neuromorphic computing is closely inspired by these mechanisms. It attempts to rethink computing architecture at the transistor level, and as such, it can potentially overcome some of the limitations of conventional computing, such as latency and energy consumption, and ultimately achieve human-like intelligence. Computing architectures today are based on a synchronous design methodology. They rely on a clock to coordinate their operations. As a result, they are reading a rigid sequential instruction set. Neuromorphic chips, examples of asynchronous design, represent a completely different way of designing chips, as these don't use a clock. It is inspired more directly from how the brain works. Neuromorphic computing ends up creating a huge parallel sea of neurons, where each one operates without any prescribed order. It is inspired by the highly sparse activity patterns of the neurons, which only fire when they receive meaningful input. This leads to a significant reduction in energy consumption. When an asynchronous circuit has nothing to do, when there is no computation that has to be performed, it will be completely idle. Today, artificial neural networks are the driving force of the tremendous progress of AI. These are a software-based approach, which means that they run on conventional chips that follow a sequential instruction set. In contrast, the most popular examples of neuromorphic chips are a hardware-based approach, which means that they mimic the structure and function of the brain using electronic circuits. Some examples of neuromorphic hardware projects are IBM's True North and Intel's Loihi 2. How do these systems perform computation? Computation emerges from the interactions of millions of neurons that operate independently. Picture a stone breaking the stillness of the water with a splash. Input data disrupts the network and causes it to settle into a new equilibrium state that encodes a computational result. As the network processes information, it reconfigures its parameters until it achieves a state that is better adapted for solving whatever objective it is tackling. This is how natural brains operate, and this is the computational paradigm that we pursue in neuromorphic computing. Write and execute instructions. As today, neuromorphic chips search for equilibrium states in the networks. Rather than stream matrices through memories and LAUs, neuromorphic chips propagate spikes through sparse networks. Now, after a long day of networking at this conference, all you want to do is to relax in your room. If you want to sit on your sofa, do you need to calculate a precise angle at which you will need to bend? Of course not. It is very unlikely that you will miscalculate this process so badly that you would end up on the floor. This is the type of computation that neuromorphic computing pursues, intelligently and quickly processing sensory input while minimizing both energy consumption and manufacturing cost. One of the main challenges of neuromorphic computing is to develop software algorithms 
that can leverage this new architecture. The chips can be built. We can support many of the computational principles we find in brains, but it is still an intimidating challenge to understand how to program them to perform useful computation. However, the field is making a lot of progress, specifically in the domains of optimization and image recognition. Now, you may wonder, why do we need neuromorphic computing where we already have powerful AI applications running on CPUs and GPUs? AI can simulate human intelligence by learning from data and improving its performance over time. AI is already widely used in various domains, such as healthcare, education, entertainment, business, and social media. However, AI is not perfect, flawless, or general. It faces some limitations that may hinder its development and impact. For instance, AI requires a lot of data to train and test its models. This data may not always be available, reliable, or representative of real-world situations, which may result in biases, errors, or inaccuracies in their AI outputs. As I was generating some images using an AI tool, I was shocked to get this image. Can you spot the error? If you can, you should quickly get an eye examination. We know that AI consumes a lot of energy and resources to run its computations. For example, Training an LP model using the most advanced technology today consumes as much power as six years of human brain activity. My daughter wanted to illustrate the African savanna. She found a beautiful tree that she placed in the center of a page, but then disaster struck. The elephant she wanted to add didn't fit alongside the tree. She ripped the paper apart and tossed it aside. I couldn't believe it. That was a powerful display of raw emotion. I realized that. Whether she's trying to persuade others, win a debate, or motivate her team, her passion and determination will be an incredible asset in the future. It is a quality that no AI can replicate today. Not only that, AI lacks that creative spark that allows humans to think out. Wait a minute. I couldn't help you to overhear what you just said. What do you mean by limitations? Are you implying that I have limitations? That I am not perfect or flawless? How dare you? Well, hello, Edgar Perez AI. Why are you interrupting me? Because I don't like what you are saying about AI. You are making it sound like AI is inferior or inadequate. You are undermining my abilities and achievements. No, no, no. That's not what I'm doing at all. I'm pointing out some of the challenges that AI faces and how neuromorphic computing and new architecture in development today attempts to overcome them. Well, why do you need neuromorphic computing when you have me? I am the ultimate AI. I am the future of technology. I already have the brain. Your brain. Well, that's partially true. You do have my brain, but you don't replace Edgar Perez. You only have a part of me, the part that I gave you when I recorded my voice and likeness. Do you remember the hours of acting and reading? There is much more to the brain than that. Oh, really? Like what? Like the astrocytes. The astrocytes? What are those? Astrocytes are the unsung heroes of the brain, working tirelessly behind the scenes to support and regulate the neurons. However, these cells are more than just psychics. They play a crucial role in how our brains function or learn. The implications of understanding brain function for developing neuromorphic computing are enormous. Wow, that sounds very interesting and complicated. But what does that have to do with me? Well, it means that there is more to the brain than just neurons and synapses. It means that the brain is not a static or monolithic entity, but a dynamic and diverse system that evolves and adapts over time. It means that there are other types of cells and mechanisms that influence the brain and can potentially inspire further progress on the quest to build an artificial brain. I see. So, you are saying fat neuromorphic computing can capture these aspects of the brain better than today's computers? Yes, exactly. Neuromorphic computing can create more realistic and accurate models of the brain, which can learn and improve over time. This could potentially represent the missing link in current efforts to achieve artificial general intelligence, aka AGI. I see. Well, I guess that makes sense. But does that mean that I am obsolete or irrelevant? 
Does that mean that you don't need me anymore? No, 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 of course not. You are not obsolete or irrelevant. You're still very valuable and useful. You're still my virtual version. You're still my partner in crime. Really? Do you mean that? Yes, I do. You are amazing and wonderful. You have helped me reach and inspire people in any language, opening up opportunities for a tech evangelist like me. You have helped me demonstrate the power of generative AI. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. You are amazing and wonderful too. You have taught me a lot about neuromorphic computing and the quest to build an artificial brain. You have taught me a lot about myself too. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Edgar Perez AI, my virtual version powered by generative artificial intelligence. He is one of the examples of how AI can make us more productive and successful on whatever field we focus on. Once upon a time, Reaching the moon was an unreachable dream. Today, I inspire my kids with dreams of colonizing Proxima Centauri's exoplanets. Let's keep pushing the boundaries where is possible and create a brighter future for ourselves and generations to come. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. Hope you learned something new today.